to the gospel, to the gospel of Matthew, to the gospel of Matthew, chapter number 11. We have with us, amen, a, a good friend of mine is here today. They traveled from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, his name is Brother James Walker, and his wife Chrissy is with us. Just stand up if you will. I know you've already probably stood. Amen. I, I worked with him for 10 years, and um, he said, when I retired, he said, I'm going to come down, and even before so, I said, man, I'm going to come down, I'm going to come down, and I guess he misses me that much. <laughs> he's, he's not having as much fun as he was having when I was there, and so he came, he drove all the way here to be with us today. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. And if you're ever in Whitehall, Ohio, be careful. Because he is a Whitehall police officer also. Amen. And Whitehall is the most dangerous city in Ohio. Amen. But we thank Brother James for being here and his wife. She makes a wonderful apple pie. I hope there's one in the car. Uh, praise the Lord. I give honor to the Lord and to my wife who was tuning in. And I want you to know that she's doing better. Amen. I said, I know she's doing much, much better because on my way out the door, she had the trash in front of the door. And I know what that means. Take out the trash. Amen. So praise the Lord, Sister Bendoff. <laughs> my son is here today. Amen. Thank the Lord for him. We have visitors that I, amen, haven't seen before. We thank God for all of our visitors. Amen. It's a beautiful crowd. Sister Jerry, it's good to see you. Amen. God bless you. Sister Kay, Mother Kay, we're so grateful. Amen. That the fire didn't burn. Amen. How many of you know that if you walk through the fire, it shall not burn you? Amen. He's God in the fire. I said it's going to take eternity for us to figure out this God that we serve. Amen. And so we're grateful for all that are here. Brother Jermaine, we thank the Lord for you. Amen. Quickly, quickly in the word of the Lord, uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. Matthew 11. Verses 1 through 5. And we're not going to be long before you today. We just want to uh, say a few things to encourage you. And um, help you to hopefully have a better week. Maybe someone is here today that wants to be saved. And that's always the goal when we come to the house of the Lord is that someone would make an intelligent decision by giving their life to Christ. 
Matthew 11, beginning with verse 1, and it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. While they were gone away, he wanted to go back over and preach and to teach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do Hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. If we if you don't mind, let me read six. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. We thank you for those that are here on today for life and for your many wonderful blessings. And we pray that you would have your way in this place today. Cause the backslider to come home. Lord God, cause the sinner man, woman, boy or girl to choose you and to serve you in the beauty of holiness. Lord God, now we thank you for the spirit that rests in this place. Move upon us all. Help us to leave differently than when we came. And we'll be forever thankful. In Jesus' name, amen. As you get ready to take your seat, look at somebody next to you and say to them, neighbor, that should have been enough. Amen. Wrong neighbor, wrong neighbor. Look at another neighbor and say, neighbor. That should have been enough. Put your hands together and give God some praise. That should have been enough. When we look at verse 2 of our text, straight to the text, John had heard while he was in prison. They have arrested John. They arrested John because he told Herodias that it was unlawful for him to have, amen, his wife, his brother's wife. And they said, now you. You're not supposed to talk to him like that. This is a powerful man. And John looks at him straight in the face because John, amen, was a holiness preacher. And when you're a holiness preacher, you can't afford to pull punches. Holiness preacher will tell it as it is, and they will swear to their own hurt. They set their face like a flint. And the scripture says that you ought to be instant, in season, and out of season to reprove. You got to reprove. Sometimes when God gives you a message of reproof, you have to sometimes rebuke when God gives the message of rebuke. And sometimes there has to be doctrine. And when God gives the message in the time for doctrine, you have to preach the doctrine. Oftentimes, enemies have been formed. Some folk can handle rebuke. They can handle reproof. 
sometimes doctrine can sometimes set people apart. But it is something that we have to, from time to time, do when God lays it up on our heart. You shouldn't have your brother's wife. And for this cause, they arrested John and cast him into prison. John had previously said that he would decrease and that the Christ would increase. He was a very popular person. Many people were flocking to John because he was baptizing in the Jordan. They thought that he may have been the Christ. He had to answer to them concerning his position on whether he was or was not the Christ. He said in John 1 and 20, he confessed and denied, but confessed and says, I am not the Christ. But I am one that comes to prepare the way for him. When the Christ comes, you may think that I, John the Baptist, am powerful, but I am not worthy to untie or to tie his shoes. The Christ, amen, will do more than baptize with water, but he shall baptize with fire. This great gathering of people who went out in the wilderness to hear John, but John confessed, I'm not the one. John, the writer of the gospel, which is not John the Baptist, and Jesus said, and I believe we had it in our Bible study on Wednesday night, that born among women, there is none greater prophet than that of John the Baptist. So when we look at the prophets that were in the scriptures, we look at Moses, we look at Elisha and Elijah, who has yet to die. Uh, those are some great men of God. Jesus said that John was the greatest of them all. My brothers and sisters, John the writer of Revelation, and John, the writer of the book, the Gospel of John. John, in writing the Gospel of John, he wants his readers to know that Jesus is divine. He starts off and says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. There is not anything that was made that was not made by him and for him. He wants to inject into his readers that Jesus is more than just an earthly king, Matthew. He's more than just a servant, Mark. And Luke, he's more than just the God-man. But that he is God incarnate. It was the Apostle Paul who picked it up and said, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested 
in the flesh. And so now understanding when John writes, he has to let the people know John the Baptist was a great prophet. But John was not the one. But John waited for the one to come. John prepared and preached and, amen, he, he, he told them that one was mightier than him. And when he seen Jesus as he was baptizing in the Jordan, he said, behold, this is by the Holy Ghost. He said, behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Oftentimes, I know most of you can quote that scripture, but there's a whole lot of depth in that scripture. To take away the sins of the world. You know all the sin that is going on in the world nowadays. Praise the Lord. But Jesus came to take away all of them. We, we, we're wondering even now when we look at the television screen and the news and on the internet and on our telephones, man, people are doing a lot of things. But you got to also understand that there is a mirror that we can also look into. And it's not only other people that have problems. But we have problems ourselves. But don't get discouraged. He came to take away sins of the world. All the mass shootings, he came to take them away. All the corruption in our government, he came to take them all away. John baptizes Jesus in the Jordan River and he says, I have need when Jesus came down to be baptized of him. Uh, John says to Jesus, I have need to be baptized of thee. But Jesus says to John, suffer it to be so, that the scripture may be full, fulfilled. And as he was baptizing him, uh, the Holy Ghost appeared as in the form of a dove, and he heard a voice saying, This is my beloved son. He took him down in water, for John baptized unto repentance, of which Jesus needed none, and brung him back up out of the water. John continued to preach, and he had a whole bunch of people following him. But Jesus had not yet anyone following him. But when John began to talk to his disciples, and when he said, Behold the Lamb of God, it is then that two of his disciples that we find in John 1 and 37, that then began to follow Jesus. Those disciples were John and Andrew. When Andrew, who was following John, heard John talk about Jesus, the Bible says he went and told his brother Simon. Says, we have found him that is the Christ. We had confidence or thought that it may have been John the Baptist, but now we know for sure. I told you a few weeks ago, you got to be sure. Jesus now begins to 
get a gathering of 12 disciples and they begin to follow him. John is in jail. John performed no miracles and they thought the Pharisees and the scribes, Sadducees, put that on the list as who uh, would be the Messiah that he would perform miracles. There would be signs that would accompany him. John had no miraculous works. That's why Jesus said on many occasions, if you don't believe my words, believe my works sakes. And so Jesus began to perform uh, miracles and, and to do diff, have different signs to follow him. And in the ninth chapter of the book of Matthew, we find Jesus exploding performing miracles. Uh, in the ninth chapter of Matthew, when we look, starting at verse number 14, amen, the Bible lets us to know that some of John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, they came to Jesus. And they asked him a question because you got to understand, John is in prison. And not all of John's disciples followed after Jesus. And so you have to understand, John had a mega church. He had a great following. But two of his disciples, some of his disciples came to Jesus. The Bible says, then came to him the disciples of John saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast off, but thy disciples fast not? Jesus then began to explain to him that as long as the children of the bride chamber mourn, as long as the bridegroom is with them, they don't need to fast. But the day would come when they would fast. In other words, as long as I'm here, Jesus is saying, they don't have to fast. So Jesus then began to perform miracles. Amen. And while he was speaking to John's disciples, amen, there came a certain ruler and began to worship him. He said, my daughter is sick. She's almost dead. Could you please come and heal her? Jesus begins to walk with the man. And while he's walking with her, uh, a woman with an issue of blood comes. Uh, she touches the hem of his garment, and Jesus asked the question, saying, Who hath touched me? For he felt anointing come out of him. Uh, so many people were around because he was on his way to heal this uh, young damsel who had died. And so he healed the woman with an issue of blood. But he didn't stop there, amen. Uh, when he healed the woman, the young lady, and brought her back from death to life, he left there and two blind men were following him. And he healed the two blind men. When the two blind men were healed, there came a dumb man. And the dumb man was possessed with a devil. And Jesus cast out the devil and the dumb man begin to talk. And he went, and the Bible says, Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. These things John's disciples are aware of. They are first-hand or eyewitnesses of what Jesus had just previously done. Woman with the issue of blood. Raised a young girl from death to life. Healed the blind. Uh, caused the dumb to talk. Cast out devils. They have witnessed these things with their own eyes. 
But now when we get to our text, and I told you I wasn't going to be long, John has been in prison. And we can not only sometimes be in prison, amen, with our bodies, but sometimes prison can be in our mind. It can hold you captive. Amen. Prison in your mind can tell you and will tell you you can't do it. Prison in your mind can cause oppression and depression. So many people are in a mental state of prison uh, where they can't normally function. John prison causes doubt to enter in our spirit. And when we get in a, a prison in our mind and doubt begins to arise, no matter how much power that we possess, when you are captivated in your mind, it causes your faith to be shaken. Has anybody in here ever had their faith shaken? In other words, a crisis in your life has arisen and you're trying everything in your own power to get out of the situation. You've called your friends and they couldn't help you. Uh, you got on Facebook and it couldn't help you. You done everything because of the weight of the trial. You done everything but call on Jesus. Well, my brothers and sisters, John has no one to talk to and visiting hours aren't until next Wednesday. When visiting hours come, all of that time between the time that his disciples came back and visiting hours, the devil began to try to trap him with his thoughts. That's why the Bible says, laying aside every wind, every thought that should, should so easily beset us. Let us run this race with patience. Every imagination. You see, one of the components of our mind is our imagination. Our imagination is to think of the goodness of Jesus and all that is done for us. It is to think on that which is lovely, that which is honest, that which is pure, that which is of a good report. If there be any virtue, your imagination ought to think on them. But the devil attacks your mind. And the component of your mind, one of them is imagination. If I can isolate them and get them by themselves, I don't care how great a prophet he is. I will do my best to work on him. My brothers and sisters in here today, none of us are above an attack of the devil. I'll say it again. None of us in here are above an attack of the devil. But one thing you got to remember 
it is that not which entereth into a man that defiles him, but that which cometh out of a man, that's what defiles him. In other words, you can't help what the devil is putting in your mind. But I've come by to tell you, don't rehearse it. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't rehearse it. For when you begin to rehearse it, then you give a place for the devil. And the Bible said, give no place for the devil. If you rehearse it and you think about it and maybe and scratch your head, then you may give it room to grow. But I've come by to tell you, you've got rebuking power. You can call on the blood of Jesus and you can say, Satan, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. The blood of Jesus. How many of you know that the blood still works? It has never lost its power. It's working on John. John, maybe he's not who he said he was. John gets his visits and the visits come from his disciples. When they get there in our text, John says to his disciples, go and find Jesus. And when you find him, ask him. This is all I want you to do. I just want you to ask him. Now he is the one that I baptized and I sing the Holy Ghost in the form of a dove. Yes, that Jesus. The same one that I said I'm not worthy to unlatch his shoes. That Jesus. The one that I seen on the bank of the Jordan. And when I seen him, the Holy Ghost said, Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sins of the world. Go and find that Jesus because I'm struggling right now. And I've come by to tell you that every now and then it ain't nothing wrong when you struggle. But when you struggle, you got to go and find Jesus. Somebody shout, yeah. When you struggle, don't stay isolated. Don't try to figure it out yourself. But I heard somebody say, if you call on him, he'll answer prayer. Somebody shout, yeah. Shout, yeah. Oh, yeah. Put your hands together and give God the praise. Go and find that Jesus. His disciples had already seen Jesus. But John has to know for himself. You got to know for yourself. John asked a simple question. Go and find Jesus. When you find him, ask him. He don't have to do nothing. Just ask him, because though I'm your leader, I'm weak right now. I don't have nobody down here to encourage me. And from what it sounds like, they're getting ready to kill me. They're getting ready to put my head on a platter. But I got to know before I leave here that he the one 
And John sends them and says, Go and ask him, Is he the one? Or should we be looking for another? They were looking for a Messiah to come and hurry up and set up an earthly kingdom because they were an oppressed people. The Roman government was oppressing the Jewish people and they wanted their Messiah to come and set up their, his kingdom. John is saying, I've been in here long enough now where his kingdom should have been set up. Ask him, is he the one or was he another one in between the one? Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, ain't nobody in between. Amen. He is the fullness. There ain't but one mediator between God and man. I feel like preaching now, uh, but it ain't time to preach. But there ain't but one mediator between God and man. And the Bible says it like this. It says the man, Jesus Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, he's the man. He's the only one. The author and finisher of my faith, my joy and sorrow, my hope for tomorrow. My bridge over troubled water, shelter in the time of storm, my all in all. Somebody shout, yeah! yeah. Go and ask him, is he the one? So his disciples come to Jesus. Jesus' disciples are gone. They're doing a tour, he has sent them out. Jesus is preaching in the cities that they came from. The disciples of John now come to Jesus and said, John has sent us here, and I'm getting ready to close, and says, are you the one, or do we look for another? Jesus, because the love that he has for John, begins to go on a miracle spree. He calls and he heals the blind man. Then he heals a lame man. He heals the lepers. He heals a deaf man and raises somebody from the dead. But lastly, and this is one of John's pet peeves, was to preach to the poor. And he said, tell John this, that the poor have the gospel preach unto them. They then returned to John and says, John, we don't have any more doubt. He's got to be the one. He has healed the blind John. Uh, he has raised the dead John. He has cleansed lepers John. The death here. And he takes time out with the poor. John then says, it's shouting time now. I don't know what you're waiting for today, but you ought to be glad that he is the one. Tell your neighbor, say neighbor, I don't have any doubts. He is the one. It should have been enough that when they seen Jesus do these things the first time and they let John know about it, it should have been enough. But that's all right. Amen. God ain't mad at you. And if you think that he can't heal, he still can heal. 
if you think that he can't deliver, he still can deliver. And I've come by to tell somebody, you're not too damaged that God cannot deliver you. And I've come by to tell somebody else that you are a survivor. Come on over here. Touch your neighbor on the shoulder and say to the neighbor, I am a survivor. I've made it through a whole lot of stuff. And all that I've made it through, I'm still not sure sometimes. Put yourself in the position of John. How many times has God made a way for you? How many times has God delivered you? How many times has God made a way for you? But in the struggle that you're dealing with now, you need him to come by one more time and say, Lord, I know you healed before. I know the death are raised. The deaf ears hear. The blind see. But I'm struggling. Lord, help me. That should have been enough. Give your neighbor high five and say, neighbor, when you almost lost your mind and God delivered you, that should have been enough. When you were in prison in your mind and God brought you out, that should have been enough. When God saved your marriage, when he saved your marriage and you're happy now, that should have been enough. When the doctor shook his head, walked out the room, but you're still here. That should have been enough, but that's all right if you call on him. Yeah! If you call on him, he'll be there. If you ask him, he'll do it for you. Somebody say, yeah. clap your hands. Hallelujah. 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 Sometimes we get in situations. And like I told you, you're not too damaged to where God won't help you. And when your mind tells you you're beyond hope, the devil is a liar because you're not beyond hope. I don't care where you've been. and I don't care how you suffered. You might even be stinking, but God can help you. Somebody said, how can you prove it? Because a man named Lazarus had been dead for four days. Jesus came. They said he stink, Lord. But that's all right with Jesus. You can stink and he'll deliver. You can stink. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, you had a stinky life you was in bad shape but God called your name said come forth all I want you to do is give me praise lift up your hands throw your head back
Hallelujah. Some of us may not understand this depth. Some of us may not be under, able to understand this depth of seemingly being so far away. When people ride past you and say, what a shame. There's no hope for her. There's no help for him. Look at him. Look at her. They're a mess. But go tell John. Go tell John. Go tell him that these people, the poor in spirit people, the cast down and not only the cast down but the cast out. The man got healed of blindness and was scared to tell him that it was Jesus. His parents even said, he's grown. You got to ask him. We don't want to tell you it was Jesus because if we do, you're going to cast us out of the temple. But that's all right. It was still Jesus. Send me where you want to send me. It was still Jesus. Put me on the guillotine. Don't say nothing. Peter said, turn this cross. Turn it upside down. He was getting ready to crucify Peter. He said, turn it upside down. I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Christ my 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 one of these days it won't be long we're gonna see him somebody said I can't wait to see mama somebody said I can't wait to see daddy or that loved one that's alright if that's what you want to do when you get there but the first hallelujah Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. That's the wrong neighbor. Turn to the other neighbor and say, neighbor. The first person that I want to see is my Savior. I want to see the one who brought me out. One in my body. One. One. Oh, I want to see him. Everybody's on your feet right now. We're going to let you go. Your mind can sometimes be under attack, but let's remember the lesson today. 
isolation. That's why we're not, when we're born again, we're not born to be alone. Scripture says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the testimonies. We need one another. We need one another. So my brothers and sisters, knowing that we need one another to encourage one another, to lean, to lean on one another, to draw one from another. Someone here today, you may not know Jesus in the free pardon of your sin. You may think that you're damaged goods. You may think that there's no hope for you. You've done too much. You've caused too much carnage in your life. You're not worthy. Well, there may be someone here that says, I'm just not ready. But we even pray, Lord, loose that shackle. Jesus is ready for you today. And like Queen Esther in the Bible, who knows? God has brought you into the kingdom for such a time as this. This is your day. The Lord is calling you, calling you into a repentant life and a life to be shared with him in the beauty of holiness. Don't put off tomorrow for what you could do today. Tomorrow's not promised to you. Is there one today? Come on. Come on. And it's time to be saved. Come on, sinner man, sinner woman. Boy or girl, young people, you could be saved. Come, you can you can come. And, and I know that you feel to come. But you can't worry about who's sitting next to you. The Bible says you got to save yourself from this untoward generation. Jesus is saying, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke and learn of me. My yoke is easy, my burdens are light. The yoke of the world is a heavy yoke. Come. Come. You feel the need to come. And if you think I'm guessing, then I want you to come up here and you take the microphone and you try to guess a little bit. But you feel the need to come. Why don't you come? All you have to do if you're in too deep into the sanctuary, just tell your neighbor, excuse me, it's time for me. Is there another today? Why don't you come? You say, well, give me another sign and I may think about it. You feel a tingling in your arms right now. That's you. I want you to come. You feel it? Who feels that tingling, that lightness in their arms right now? Come. I'm talking to you. You feel it? You feel it in your body. Why don't you come? 
That's the spirit of God moving upon you right now. Come. I love the singing more than just as much as anybody in here, but this is an important part of the service. Look at all these young people on this altar. Come on, anoint them and lay hands on them, elders. In the name of Jesus, is there anybody else? God is so good to us.